everybody. Thank you for joining us this afternoon. I am so excited today. Um, gosh, Dr. Patrick and I have busy schedules, but she's someone that I just always like to make time for, a colleague, a friend. We've been working together in these many fields of functional medicine and environmental toxicity for many, many years. And I just have such great respect for the level of science and quality of information that she brings to our field. Um, we're going to talk about heavy metals and toxic toxicants and all kinds of toxins and relation to the immune system, because that's such a relevant topic for our last year and in general. And um, I think you'll really, really enjoy the content. Um, I want to be sure and mention also that um, we have an, a conference coming up, the Environmental Health Symposium. I think that's the second weekend in April. Is that right, uh, Lynn? It's correct, 15th through the 17th. And Dr. Jill and I will be moderating and Dr. Jill is going to be speaking, not only speaking, I think this is the first time that we've had you on the Environmental Health Symposium where you're just free. I mean, it, it's your brain for free. People get all the wisdom and all the knowledge and the clinical experience and guidance that you have. It's just going to be an open Q&A, right? You're just going to yes. be to answering any questions relating to immunity, um, metal exposure, toxic exposure, co-infections. So I think that's going to be one of the highlights of VHS. Honestly, I'm really glad it worked out that way. I think that we need more of that. You know, we need more just tell us where you're stuck, healthcare providers, and we will give you some guidance. And so um, I'm really looking forward to it. As well, we have some surprise, I don't want to call it surprise guests because they're, it's a conference and they're speakers. But I found this uh, gentleman, he's a pediatrician in Hong Kong, Dr. Paul Lamb, who has been treating, are you ready for this? He has been treating uh, pregnant women, detoxing them for metal toxicity. He's been treating infants and children who have really serious clinical conditions and reversing them by identifying and eliminating the metals in their body. Wow. Safe. Yeah. So he's, and he's been doing this for many years. Um, I've known Dr. Paul, I think I met him in 2012. And he's just the kindest and wisest uh, gentleman uh, and, and really humane physician. And so he's gonna really guide us through some cases that I think will help us all. He also treats adults with uh, metal toxicity. So oh, I think that'll be great. Uh, we have Dr. Larry Polevsky. I don't know if you know Dr. Larry, but he's one of my best buddies. He's a pediatrician in New York. And Dr. Polevsky has been identifying and addressing uh, immune related problems in children for his entire career as a pediatrician. He's also gonna give a very factual uh, medical literature based talk on vaccines that I've heard before, that this is an update that is mind blowing because we're really gonna get to look into the science behind vaccination. So I think that'll be wonderful. Um, Dr. Anne-Marie Fine and I are going to do a day-long introduction to environmental medicine from a brand new perspective. Jill, we've never taught this way. So here's what we've done. You know how we're always just like factoids, 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 you know, just uh, drinking out of a fire hose. So it doesn't work that great. <laughs> yeah, we like it sometimes, but yeah, it's just not so practical. So, so here's what we've done is we flipped everything and said, so what if this patient walks into your office and here's the neuroinflammation that they present with, the neurotoxicity they present with, the autoimmune disease they present with, the cardiovascular disease, the obesity, the diabetes, the infertility. How do you address toxic exposure from that perspective? What are the most likely toxicants, wow. what are the most likely metals and solvents and pesticides and phthalates? And how can you judiciously address this and then what, what are the treatment interventions? So I think, I, I'm hoping, I mean, we'll see, but I'm hoping that that'll be just easier to learn. It'll stick better. And, and that uh, everybody can become aware of the exposures that are related to these conditions. So I think that's, that's gonna be fun. That's gonna be really fun. More stories, more patient stories, because that's how people learn, right? right. So do you, hey, speaking of, do you want a patient story? Yes. I think that would be fun. Okay. So, uh, many years ago, I had a nurse come in who had uh, peripheral neuropathy. So that's numbness and tingling in the hands and the feet, stocking gloves. So, you know, it, it's, uh, it's a, it was constant for her, this constant numbness and tingling and just 
uh, pain in her hands and her feet. Interestingly, unfortunately for her, she worked in a law firm that did what? Environmental toxicant medicine. Wow. <laughs> so she had gone to her neurologist and she had said, I don't know, do you think this could be related to arsenic? Yeah. Uh, because I've heard in, in my work at the law firm that, you know, arsenic toxicity can cause this. And the neurologist said, probably not, but I'll test if you want to. So he looked in her blood, which is the wrong place, uh, for arsenic, and he didn't find any. He said, absolutely not. You don't have any arsenic toxicity. So somehow she found her way to me. And I said, well, uh, let's look in the right place, which is in the urine. And sure enough, she was loaded. Mm -hmm. It turned out that um, she had a fascinating story. So she was working as a nurse, but you know, when she went home, she was helping her husband build a deck out in the back. Mm -hmm. And they were using what is called CCA, that's the name of the treatment, wood, which is outdoor wood, right? It's, so it's treated wood. Mm -hmm. And the way that they treat it is they soak the wood in copper chromate, not the, you know, cop, not right. the good kind of chromium three, but chromium six, which is toxic and arsenic. Oh. And that's why it's so heavy, mm -hmm. right? So she was working uh, all summer, helping her husband build the deck. It was raining and she was not so great at wearing gloves, right? So she was actually absorbing this arsenic from the wood, from her hands into her body. And we know that that's possible. Uh, there are a lot of uh, playgrounds across the United States that are built out of this CCA wood, right? Uh, that are a danger to children because when it gets wet, not when it's dry, but when it gets wet, you can actually absorb some of that arsenic into your palms of your hands through the wood. So not only that, but she had arsenic in her water supply. Um, she had a well, which is the greatest risk for arsenic. Mm -hmm. And her neurologist, of course, you know, he just wasn't oriented that way. That wasn't his orientation to ask her if she had checked her water for arsenic, to ask her if she had any exposure. She knew that the CCA was exposure, but he had convinced her. So anyway, what we did for um, this dear woman was we, uh, you know, we tested her water. She was, she just hadn't done it. Uh, and she had pretty high levels of arsenic. And that's for 108 million people in the United States of America, their arsenic levels are over the allowable legal limit for arsenic in drinking water. That's a lot of people. And we have a really serious problem. Our infrastructure isn't that great in terms of getting arsenic out of the drinking water supply and regulatory agencies are not that good at actually punishing. Right or fining municipalities that can't regulate their arsenic levels. So this is a multi-stage uh, issue, you know, multi-layer process. So at any rate, um, she was able to get just a good old reverse osmosis water filter. I'll talk about that later. Uh, that got the arsenic out of her water. We gave her some methylated B vitamins, selenium, um, uh, um, uh, Sammy, I think she ended up taking Sammy. All those things are really good to help the body process and eliminate arsenic. And um, uh, methylated B12, that was the other thing. And, and her peripheral neuropathy uh, resolved. It took, you know, it took a while, it took a couple of months mm -hmm. because as you know, that's damage to the nerves right. and the nerves actually have to heal. So uh, it's not like taking uh, ibuprofen for a headache. You know, you really have the nerves really have to heal. Uh, but I, I've been thinking about this quite a bit because I just did a, um, a podcast on arsenic and how huge a problem it is that it's, it's the number one toxic metal wow. in the United States as per the Center for Disease Control. So the Center for Disease Control has a list of 200 toxicants, you know, all of them, um, based on how likely you are to get exposed to them and how sick you may get. So they have a formula where they put those two variables together and arsenic comes up number one. And the World Health Organization has actually rated it right up near the top. So the, the good thing, the good news is this is something we can do something about, right? Yeah. It's coming from somewhere. It's yeah. either coming from our drinking water, it's coming from our vegetables, which mm -hmm. is the highest source of the inorganic arsenic, that's the poisonous kind, um, in our environment, because why? 
What do you think? Multiple choice question. The reason vegetables are the number one source of arsenic is because of rainwater of, or of pesticide uh -huh. uh, exposure. Oh, yeah. Of course. Two, number two, listen to number two, bio sludge application to conventionally grow. That's what I was wondering if the, you know, manure, the old, the old term for that was manure in the farm. <laughs> well, now, guess what? They don't use manure. They use something that's legally called biosolids. Wow. You remember the Clean Air Act and the Clean Water yeah. Act right back in the 70s? So way back in the 70s, corporations that produced things that they no longer could burn into the air or throw into the water thought, well, what's left? The soil. So they enacted all this legislation to allow the application of what are called biosolids onto agricultural soil. They'd throw a little zinc, a little mm -hmm. phosphorus. You're a farm girl, you know, this, yeah. uh, you know, potash in there mm -hmm. and sell it as fertilizer. So unfortunately, um, there are no good regulations that mm -hmm. prohibit high levels of arsenic, cadmium, and lead, those are the wow. three biggies, yeah. into those biosolids. So the plants will take them up and they end up in the plants. So this is just one great big commercial for doing what? Eating organic food. Yes. <laughs> because, because, well, because you can't use legally use biosolids in organic agriculture. So when people say, you know, oh man, I, you know, I just don't have the money to eat organically. I'm like, well, do you, have you thought, this is not a good thought, but yeah. have you thought about how much it costs to have cancer? Yeah. Have you really thought about the cost of having cancer? And nobody thinks about those right. things. Cancer is extremely expensive. Having an autoimmune disease is extremely right. expensive. Even the detox protocol that you took her through for three to four months is extremely expensive. Right. So Right, exactly, exactly. But she was willing and ready and absolutely 100%. And what a great thing that she had enough exposure to her law firm to know the questions to, to ask. And I just encourage you, whether you're a practitioner or patient listening, if you're a practitioner, you probably are in the functional or integrative realm. If you're a patient, um, don't take, to take these answers if you feel like there's something more. Keep searching because often there are underlying root causes. And again, I come from conventional training and we're not taught to really dig deep and look for things like arsenic. So it's, it's a, this is, this is rare. Um, and now, you know, I love Dr. Lynn Patrick so much. She's so knowledgeable on these things. And I always learn more when I'm talking to her. Um, you guys are going to love the conference. Uh, we're going to have this and so much more. And the main topic is on toxicants, toxins, heavy metals, et cetera. So we'll talk a little bit more about those. Um, and I love the um, I love the speakers that you bring as well. I want to highlight that. If you guys want the, anywhere you watch this video, you'll see a link below to look at the speakers, the schedule. You can sign up anytime it's online, so you can be at your home in your pajamas and watching it. And of course, um, you know the the timeline. I believe is that. Um, tell me the days. Is it a Friday, Saturday? Um, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. Okay, perfect. Yeah, and uh, you know your friend and mine, Dr. Neil Nathan. Mm -hmm. Is yeah. going to be there talking about the cell danger response, mold and metals, which is something that, you know, as uh, clinicians who look at exposures, uh, we're taught to look at one at a time, right? Like it's barely, we can barely wrap our head around just one toxic. Right. But the reality is, and you know this, that all of our uh, sick patients are usually exposed to multiple things, right? not just infections like Lyme and co-infections or mold exposure, but metals and solvents and pesticides yeah. and phthalates and the whole ball of wax. And so looking at that whole ball of wax is really an art. And I think Dr. Nathan is very skilled in being- I do too. And I, if you haven't heard about cell danger response, stay tuned, come to the conference. I think this is one of the most monumental, it's the um, Dr. Navio's work. Um, and this is basically one of the underlying mechanisms that explains so much of our chronic infection and toxic load. And I've always said, sometimes I'll do the, the overview lectures, but I always just think real simply, and we have this toxic load and infectious burden. And I would say nearly 100% of my patients with chronic illness have some weighted balance of those two. And my job as a clinician is to figure out what's in their bucket, what's in the infectious load, what's in the toxic burden. But the best thing, and I'd love your comments on this, Lynn, is if we think about that bucket and patients, just like your patient with arsenic, her toxic load was increasing, immune system was decreasing because of that. Maybe infections were involved too, but the main thing for her was that overload of arsenic. 
But we don't always have to know every single last toxin in the bucket because a lot of times these generalized principles, like there is different mechanisms for removing lead versus say um, another type of you know toxin like ketomium sure. mold. However, to detox in general, there's a lot of commonalities. And then when we go into naturopathy and infrared sauna and hydrotherapy and Epsom salt baths and these things are universal. So the great thing is we can take 80% of our detox and it applies to the whole toxic load. Any comments on that or how to, because I think clinicians, if you're listening, patient or clinician, tox, toxicants, toxicity, environmental toxic load could be overwhelming and very pessimistic, but I feel like it's not that way. Well, the good news is, and I want to use a specific example. So you are very familiar with the study that Dr. Stephen Genoas did. Mm -hmm. He looked at um, a very small sample of patients who were sick and then some who were not sick and he put them in a sauna. And then he actually looked at what came out in their uh, urine and what came out in their sweat. And he looked at what was in their blood. And what he found was that the, uh, the ability to sweat, you know, just, it doesn't have to be fancy. You know, Dr. Jill, I have helped so many people get better if they didn't have access to a sauna or they couldn't afford to buy a sauna. I had them go in their bathroom with a little space heater shut yep. the door, put a towel under the door and literally sit in their bathroom for an hour and sweat and they got better. So it's a kind of a universal um, technology. But what he found, in the, and I think that this speaks to your point, is that in those folks who were able to sweat, what he found in their urine and in their sweat was increased levels of metals like cadmium, very hard to get cadmium out of the body and very common toxicant because it's in that, those biosolids, right? It ends up in our food as well as in cigarette smoke. But he also found that bisphenols, which are a common plasticizer in our drinking water, they can be in our polycarbonate bottles, they're in the canned food, they're in our cosmetics those levels were also really strongly elevated as well as um, aluminum. We can sweat out aluminum, right? Oh, and aluminum, that's a hot and huge problem. I was consulting with some doctors in India and their patients and 100% of the, the cases, I don't know if it's because they're cookware, but I was finding such high levels of aluminum. And again, you as you know- Where's it coming from? Um, well, I, was, I, I suspect that their, um, their cookware might be an issue. Uh, yeah, yeah, for sure. But that was my biggest suspicion because they all had common types of cookware. And uh, again, it was, I don't know that I for sure know the sources, but it was so common. And I think the U.S. as well. In fact, when I do a heavy metal panel on LabCorp Quest or whatever lab, aluminum is not typically included in there. And I will actually add that now. Um, is there any, is serum still a good, or whole blood the best way for aluminum? Or would you test a different way? Would you do? Oh, the, so I have been so conflicted about this, that I invited one of the global aluminum experts to wow. eat. So Chris Shaw is coming, uh, Christopher Shaw from a University of British Columbia to talk about his research. You know, he's a neuroscientist <clears throat> and he's done quite a bit of research on aluminum, but this is a big problem. It is. Because we don't have good tests for aluminum. We just don't. So I wish I could give you an answer, but I don't think there is one. Mm -hmm. That's how I feel too. I'm like, I'm not sure which way to go for now. I'm doing the yeah. blood sample, but hopefully after EHS, you and I will be updated, you right. know, in, in what really is the best test, but to get back to sauna. So sauna is also a really good way to um, eliminate some pesticides. We can actually get organochlorine pesticides. You know, those are the legacy yeah. ones that are in our fat mm -hmm. and 99% of us have, you know, DDT metabolites in our fat. It's just that it's in right. our diet. And we probably inherited some from our mom. And the half-life is so long that we can't hardly. <laughs> half-life. So that's a hundred years to get it out of your body. So, you know, we have to help that process yeah. just by itself. We're not going to do it. So that's one of, I think, the beauties of using those uh, low cost, potentially low cost technologies. Yeah. Uh, of course, they're, not everybody can handle sauna. Uh, folks who are really environmentally ill or who have POTS, you know, uh, postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome. That's, you know, where you get dizzy and when you lay down, your uh, heart rate goes up. Uh, those folks have difficulty and they need to be very slowly ac uh, accustomed to uh, sweating. 
And nowadays there's, like you said, space heater in the bathroom. I have recommended that too. And then on that, even on the other spectrum, there's this couple of companies make the sauna blankets, um, the little cubicles that you sit inside. And then of course the full blown ones, but those can range from well under a thousand dollars, which is still is a cost, but they're much more affordable now. And space heater in the bathroom is still a good option. You know, it's just sweating. It doesn't matter how you do it. Yeah. Like, a lot of the doctors that I train ask me, well, aren't, isn't far infrared really the only way to sauna? It's not. Right. And, and the, uh, that study that I was just mentioning, Dr. Genoas, he actually compared infrared sauna to radiant heat sauna. Mm -hmm. And he found that the level of excretion in the sweat was equivalent. Wow. The so level of excretion in the urine was equivalent. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't matter. You know, it's and I wonder if, I mean, some of the new, um, the, the infrared near and far, and I'm suspecting there might be some healing properties, like maybe increased collagen yeah. production with the near infrared. But if you're just focusing on detox, which is the majority of our patients, then like you said, just getting them to sweat. What about people who don't sweat? What would you say about them? To me, that's so the biggest. I learned from my mentor, Dr. William Ray, mm -hmm. who was a cardiothoracic surgeon who practiced environmental medicine for 40 years is that those people have dysautonomia. Yeah. And so they have an imbalance between their nervous systems, mm -hmm. uh, the sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system that prevents sweating. Uh, so the treatment protocol for dysautonomia, and by the way, those folks also are environmentally exposed. That's right. how wow, they got that problem in the first place, can be treated and addressed. And of course, let's just take an example. If somebody's in a moldy home, it doesn't matter how much you put them in the sauna. Right. Do you get them out of the moldy home? They're not going to sweat in the sauna, right? Mm -hmm. So you have to remove them from all the toxins they're exposed to. But once you do that, very short periods in the sauna. So five minutes is useful. Then they can work up to 10. I had a patient who it took him a year to uh, be able to tolerate an hour of sauna, but the man got better and he was very, very ill. Uh, so I, that's, the, that's the standard protocol for folks who have... Uh, who don't have the ability to Yeah, sweat. that's exactly. I'll have them uh, turn on the sauna and get in at 100 degrees and stay for three minutes. And what they'll do, or actually, I'm sorry, I set it to maybe 130, but get in at 100. So it's just slowly rising in temperature. And by the time they're at three minutes, it might be 105. And then the next time they go to five minutes. And so what happens is over maybe 10 to 15 minutes, they start to get to the top temperature of 130. And then as they start to get there, they can go up to 30 minutes. And um, once they get to 130 for 30 minutes, they can go a little hotter, but it's just a very slow. And I usually have them um, no more than two or three times a week at that very low temperature. And if they have the, that evening or the next day, sequelae where they don't feel well, they've overdone it. They take a break, they go back to lower doses. I always give tri salts or electrolytes with the sauna. Um, often give um, binders after. I like to use uh, clay or charcoal or zeolite to create for metals. Um, any, any comments on those little protocols, tips for sauna? Absolutely yes to everything. Um, I think electrolyte replacement is absolutely necessary. When uh, in our clinic, um, which I'm no longer there, but in our clinic, we had an environmental sauna. Mm -hmm. So we uh, control the temperature and we do really keep it under 130. Yeah. You know, in gyms, sometimes those saunas are way too hot. Oh, they're terribly hot. And people go in there for 45 minutes. I'm like, you don't, that's a stressor on the body. And there's this I think of it as a cortisol response. If you get too high, you're actually making the stress response worse. You're making that sympathetic overdrive worse. So it, I agree. You can really get some, as long as you're sweating and you can do that at 1:30 very easily. Right. And you want to, there are actually, what I learned in my environmental medicine training was that there are two types of sweat glands. One is specific for um, ammonia and water. And the other is uh, uh, specific for releasing some of the lipophilic toxins. Oh, yes. So the higher the temperature, the less active those important fat releasing sweat glands are, they actually get turned off at high temperatures and you're just releasing water and ammonia. Oh, so, which is worse because then you're going to be dehydrated. And so that makes a ton of sense, Lynn. I've never heard it explained like that. So low temperature sauna is medical sauna. You know, mm -hmm. we really yeah. never go 130. So let's talk a little in our last five, 10 minutes or so about the conferences on immune system. And that's been the hot topic, of course, with our pandemic and everything people worried about immune system. Now you and I for decades have been talking about immune system. This is nothing new. Um, how, um, let's talk a little bit about the basics of how toxicants, toxins, heavy metals affect immune system. Do you wanna give us just a little tiny overview on that? Sure. I think it is probably helpful to go back to arsenic because mm -hmm. arsenic is something that we now know 108 million people are drinking it. 
you know, from their tablet. Yeah. Oh, and while we're on that subject, a simple reverse osmosis filter mm -hmm. will get the arsenic out of your tap water. Perfect. Charcoal is not as reliable, mm -hmm. uh, but reverse osmosis is very reliable. So um, arsenic is a specific immune suppressing metal. So those effects have been known for decades. And one of the things I think is interesting is that arsenic decreases macrophage function. So we know that the macrophages are like the garbage men and women of the uh, immune system. They go in and they literally will take the garbage out, right? They'll surround the garbage and remove it either through the lymphatic system um, or sometimes back into the blood. And so one of, the, one of the things I've learned is that in COVID, macrophage function is very important. Mm -hmm. uh, macrophage well. We forget the T cell mediated immunity, right? People are talking about B cells. I mean, no, no, no. It's actually T cell more, um, more important. And arsenic also suppresses uh, these cells called uh, natural killer cells. Mm -hmm. So natural killer cell function is very important in actually attacking viruses directly. We need robust natural killer cell function, right? We've got that. That is, and and again, when we're looking at viruses and cancer cells, by the way. Innate immunity is the key. Yes. That's what we need. And so I think we can say the same thing about mercury. It has a suppressing effect on natural killer cell function. So does lead, I do. Um, and all these things are in cigarettes. I mean, it's not that I would ever smoke a cigarette anyway, but now that I know what I know about what's inside of cigarettes, I can't. I mean, Somebody would have to, buy, you know, put me in handcuffs to get me a smoke. Well, unless I'm real briefly, because a lot of kids are vaping now, or adults, I shouldn't say just kids, but same thing, right? You're not losing the risk. In fact, I think there's higher levels yeah. of metals yeah. in vaping than in regular smoking. It is not, there's nothing yeah. safe about vaping, nothing. It's, uh, you know, it's more addictive mm -hmm. than smoking cigarettes. Yeah, absolutely. So back to immune function. So I think that we are at this place with COVID where we, we literally, there's a fork in the road mm -hmm. and we've got to go one way or the other. We can't hang out in the, at the junction anymore. We have to make choices about how we live, how we spend our money, yeah. um, how we take care of our bodies that go down that, you know, left hand or right hand side, whichever one it is to uh, robust innate immunity Yes, because we don't have any choice any longer. You know, and I, and, uh, I don't want to talk about the vaccine because um, it's so political. But one thing I will say is I heard a vaccine developer lately, uh, you may have heard him talk, and he said one of the potential risks with the vaccine is that it may allow for more variants. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, so those variants will affect those of us who may have chosen not to be vaccinated, right? So it's everybody now. It's all of us. We all have to make very conscious choices about innate immunity. And avoiding metals and improving metal excretion is, in my book, one of those choices. Like, we actually have to choose that. I think, Lynn, if we had to have a takeaway of, like, what to do in this era and everything, we must start choosing to do daily detoxification things. I've always told people, 21-day yes. detox, 30-day January 1st, that's great, no problem, but... If you are not choosing, like I am I practice what I preach. I know you do as well. I choose every single day to do things like sauna or a charcoal or clay or eat clean, all organic or drink purified water. And you've heard me say clean air, clean water, clean food. Some of these things do not have to be incredibly expensive or difficult. It's very simple because what we put in our body protects us from accumulating that load and then choosing to do like the types of food that we eat, the type of water we drink, the air quality, using air filtration systems, Epsom salt baths, infrared sauna, um, space heater in your bathroom, these things, you have to make a choice every day and you do have to choose. Unfortunately, in this century, we must choose to, to put some of that in because if we don't, the load is so great that we're all going to be overcome in some way by it. And I don't mean to be fatalistic, but I've realized, um, I'm sure you've seen this too, 10, 15 years ago, when I started seeing functional medicine practice patients, 
it was, you know, a thyroid disorder and three months later they were well. I never see that anymore. The complexity level is uh, so 10 to hundred times greater than it was even in one or two decades. And I believe that the hidden elephant in the room, which was one of the titles of our conference is the toxic load. And, you know, I just heard, um, just for everybody, mm -hmm. Shanna Swan, who is one of our renowned, she started looking at this long before anybody else even cared or knew back in the 70s. She just written a book. And I'm so sorry that I don't have the title of it. Oh, but one of the things- And we'll add it to the, we'll add that. Well, one of the things she says, and this just came out in an article, I think in the New York Times, is that her estimation based on the literature is that by 2045, the male sperm count in the world globally will be zero. Wow. Is it called Countdown? I think I found it by the Shana Swan PhD. Yep. yep. Think. Okay. So she is one of our just renowned, really beloved, uh, very well-respected researchers in the field of endocrine disruption. She yeah. was the one who found that phthalates, pre-exposure to phthalates in the womb, so prenatal yeah. exposure to phthalates, altered the anogenital distance in boys, which was that the actual distance between the genitals of an infant boy and the anus was changing. And that is a bad thing to happen. There's a lot of reasons that it's bad, mm -hmm. but it is a bad thing to have happen. And so uh, for the last almost 30 years, she has been on the bandwagon about this and continuing to publish and she's just wonderful. But that's the reality. And the thing, Jill, that you and I both say is knowledge is power. And so we can take this knowledge and we can implement in our lives things that we can incorporate into our daily routine. I do a sauna, you know, I try and sauna every day. You know, not, I don't have to do it for an hour. I right, just do it for right. 15 minutes. That's okay. I feel so much better and I sleep so much better. Yeah, I, same thing. I just pick and choose and there's no obligation, but I, it's part of what I value, which is my health. And I just really believe we have to teach our patients to choose to value maybe taking 20 minutes a day to some practice. Again, it might be your, I use an Epsom salt bath every single night um, that I can. It's just so powerful, so simple, so mm -hmm. cheap and easy. And, um, and and then like you, I sleep better. So there's these things you can incorporate. Um, so let's just end with, I, obviously I, I'll, wherever you see this video, you'll see links to the conference, more information. Um, and as you can see why I love Dr. Patrick is she really brings some of the best and brightest brains and researchers She's always looking for who is the expert and then let's get them to the conference. Let's get them to speak. And I don't know of any other higher quality organization as far as the types of people that you're going to see. And sometimes the level of, of knowledge is pretty amazing, but there's uh, also at this conference, we're going to have some really practical ways. Like you heard, I'm going to do a live Q and a, I've never done that before on the conference, but I'm so excited because it's going to be really, really interactive. So you literally get to bring your questions and I'll be there. Um, and, just be able to answer them in real time. Great. Yeah. Environmental Health Symposium. I'll see you all there. Jill and I will be moderating. We'll be introducing and, and uh, listening to some pretty amazing uh, docs and researchers. Awesome. Well, thanks for your time today, Lynn. Um, we will talk in a few weeks. Okay, great. Thank you so much, Dr. Jill.